All right, it's good to have all of you tuning back in. We're going to take a little bit of time so that people can pull it up and see that we're here and exit out and all that other good stuff we have to do. And remind you that if you want people on your feed to be able to see us through Facebook, you can always share it. Just a little button down on the bottom right, you just share it. And people that uh, scroll across your page, your friends, your family, your connections can see also what's going on here at the church. So I think we got everybody tuning in. So let's, uh, let's start off with our visual aid this morning. Now, visually this morning, for those that are here, you might not be able to see it because you're way back in the back, and uh, <laughs> we're going to make sure the people on the screen can see it. So, anybody have any idea what this is? Ah, it is a title. That's right. A title. Show ownership. A title is something that means you possess this. It is yours. So, a title. Now, it came from the government office in an envelope. That was sealed up so well, I had to tear it apart a lot to get it out. So, um, a title, a title. Well, what does that got to do with service today? Well, we're going to jump right into it and find out. What book of the Bible have we been on Sunday morning? We are in the book of Revelation. That is right. And now the book of Revelation we see in chapter 1 where Jesus presents himself to John. John is the author of the book of Revelation. John is the was the last living disciple who walked hand in hand with Jesus. He's also the one credited for writing the Gospel of John. He's also the one that wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He is well advanced in years, and he's taken those years of, of advancement, uh, of learning, of wisdom, of knowledge, and applying it as God writes through him messages that he wants to keep for us today. Now, we see in the Gospel of John uh, that, that Jesus traces back the creation of the world through the Son, uh, copying what the Father had revealed to him in the power of the spoken word, uh, in, in, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit by the spoken word. So we see this take place. John is also one who, uh, when Jesus is talking about someone here amongst the twelve is going to betray him, that John is the one that leaned his head against Jesus' chest. Sign of intimacy and love and said, is it I? Wow. John is uh, on the island of Patmos where he's been in prison because of the testimony of Jesus Christ and because of the word that he's been preaching. Uh, they did not want the word to get out there. Therefore, they thought they could stop the movement of Christianity. They could stop the truth by imprisoning those who were promoting the truth. And while he was on the island of Patmos, instead of throwing a pity party the whole time he was there, just like Apostle Paul... <laughs> He's used by God. God speaks to him in chapter 1 through his son, speaks to uh, John, and he says, I want you to write those things which were, those things that are, and those things that will be. So chapter 1, he talks about the things that were. Chapter 2 through 3, he talks about the things that are. That's the church age. That's where you can find the seven churches that represent all the churches that we find on, the place, uh, on this planet today are going to be put in one of those seven categories. Even in individual Christians, every believer will be put in one of those seven categories. And then those things which are to come. And that's where we get chapter 4 all the way through the end of the book of Revelation. Now, if you were with us last week, we're in chapter 4. Today, we're going to be in chapter 5. we got a lot to cover, so I appreciate you tuning in. After we cover this, you may want to send this to your friends, your family, to make sure they understand the truth of what God's Word shares for us as we put it together. Uh, in, in chapter 5, verse 1, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray right now, Father, you block out any distractions. Help us to focus on your Word. Help us see your Word come to life. Help us to show us how your word applies to our life that we can be doers of your word, not just yours only. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week we saw uh, chapter 4. For the last two weeks, we talked about the one on the throne. And I presented the possibility that it was Jesus, the Son of God. He was adorned in the high priest attire. Uh, we know that he is at the right hand of the Father. We know that at the stoning of Stephen, that uh, Stephen saw him standing at the right hand of the Father. And uh, we looked at the throne as being most likely the throne that is going to bring judgment. Now, who is God that we worship? We only worship one God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's a hard concept for many people to grasp. And I've heard so many explanations trying to explain how it's possible to be three in one. The, one of the most famous is uh, H2O. You know, in a liquid form, we call it water. In the frozen form, or in the solid form, we call it ice. Uh, in the vapor form, we call it steam. And yet it's all H2O. If you capture it all, it's still the same. 
Um, my favorite one is to take, take an individual because we can all have individuals. We, many of us fulfill three different characteristics in one person. I am one person, but yet when I respond to my father, I respond as a son. I am one person, but then when I speak, I speak to my children, I speak to them as a father. So I, I, I respond as a son, I respond as a father. To my sister, I respond brotherly. That, that's a, a different aspect altogether. So we have three different characteristics, three different ways to respond, yet I'm only one person. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one person. Now we know according to Scripture, uh, even John tells us in 1 John chapter 1 that uh, our, our assistant pastor John preached through not too long ago. It says that God is light and in him is no darkness. Then we saw in the Gospel of John chapter uh, 1, it says no one has seen God. And then in chapter 6, it says no one has seen the Father except the one who is from him, which is Jesus and then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, talking about God, it says, God alone has immortality, dwelling in the unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. We're talking about an unapproachable light. Now, when John turned and he saw the throne, the throne was the central part of his focus. Uh, we see the, the, the high priestly attire, but he doesn't tell us the form that was taken on there. He just talks about the light that radiates from it, from a rainbow, from emerald to these uh, red, to the different colors that he saw. So we're going to see in just a moment, uh, we're going to see one come out of or in the midst of. And I don't want you to get confused. We serve one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand... Now, remember, right hand represents power. It represents authority. That's why when it says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, he is at the position of power and authority to do what the one who he is sitting beside wants him to do. So it says that in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back. Now, what is this scroll? There have been suggestions that it is a scroll that Daniel was told by God to seal up in chapter 12. Some speculate that it's the scroll that Ezekiel was shown by God that had the woes and lamentations on the front and the back. There could have been a different scroll. I want to tell you today that I am convinced almost to, without doubt that this scroll represents the title deed, title shows ownership, title deed to the earth. Now, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. And as I've studied for a multitude of years, this is my understanding that most likely this scroll is the title deed to the earth. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to do something we very seldom ever do at Chambersburg Baptist Church as an expository pastor, but we're going to go back into Genesis chapter 1. So flip back to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you something. I want you to see from the beginning of creation. Now, you've got to remember that God tells us that uh, Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. He knew that uh, man would sin. He knew that there would be a penalty for sin. He knew that it would only come through one who could be obedient. So in chapter 1... Look with me in, uh, down at verse 26. Then God said. Now this word God is Elohim. It is the plural form of God. It is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're talking amongst themselves. Now I don't know about you, but I talk to myself all the time. I'm always wondering if people look over there at me when I'm at a red light or whatever. Uh, it's hard to see me through a full face helmet. That's another reason I wear a full face helmet. I don't want people to see what I'm saying or what I'm doing or who I'm talking to because I'm always talking to the Lord. Always could be carried on the communication unless... Like when I go dirt bike riding, I'm communicating with the one who's leading. I'm communicating with somebody in the pack, so I'll know what's coming up. I'll know if there's a car coming out. I'll know what's going So I'm communicating with them. Sometimes I'm communicating and it's not even turned on. It's just amazing. But I'm always talking and listening, listening and listening, and talking in response. So God is talking to himself. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, I've seen a bunch of sarcastic junk out there from lost people who are ungodly, who don't even believe God exists, and they'll make fun of Christians saying, oh yeah, you're, if you're made in the image of God, how come you're not invisible? 
See, that just shows their ignorance. It shows their stupidity. And yet they're the one who wants to call us ignorant. Isn't that crazy the way that is? Well, you know, it's, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It means to have the ability to think, the ability to reason, and the ability to make choices. It's talking about morals and ethics that God has blessed us with. He wants us to reflect Him. So therefore, He created us in His... We are separated by all of the creation because we have His breath breathed into us the ability to think and reason and make choices based on our thinking and our reasoning. Now, you can look across social media today. You can look across news today, and you can see some people that maybe they just don't have the ability to think. Maybe they don't have the ability to reason. And yet, lost people call us blind and, 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 and mindless sheep following <laughs> What is not even there. It's so ridiculous that we can see truth in scriptures and yet they can't because they've been blinded to the truth because their heart isn't uplifted toward them. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. What does that mean? <laughs> this is the part where we most, most of the time don't realize. God wants us to reflect his majesty. He created us. We are referred to as his jewel, a, a jewel of creation. His crowning work. He gave us the ability in his image to think, reason, and choose, to understand moral and ethic, the choices that we are going to make. He wanted us to reflect his majesty before all other creation. So he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then it says, look at the next part. Let them. See, he already knew there would be a man and a woman. He knew that it would be plural. He knew that it wasn't just going to be a man to live forever by himself. No, he knew that it would be a family dynamic. He says, so let them have, what is that? Dominion. Dominion. What does it mean to have dominion? It is to rule as God would. That means wisely and prudently. So the creator who creates it all gives ownership to man to have dominion over it. Look, it says the, the fish, it says the birds, it says the cattle, and then the next part says over all of the earth. In other words, God has given ownership. As the creator, he's entitled to give ownership over to man, his creation. Now, what does ownership mean? I want, I want you to understand that today I have, as a visual aid, a title. This shows that I have bought something at the price it was asked of, and I own it. Now, I want to tell you that I don't have the title to my house. I have ownership. I'm paying monthly payments. I have a mortgage. Many of us have automobiles that we don't, don't have the title to, but we have ownership because we're paying the price required. And as long as we pay the price required, there will become a day of redemption where we will actually get that title in our hand. But as of now, we just have ownership of it. So God has passed ownership over to man. Look what it says now in, in chapter 2, verse 8. It says, the Lord God did what? We, we jump over this often. The Lord, I mean, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Yes, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says, the Lord God planted a garden. Many people thought that uh, Adam and Eve was there and they planted a garden. No, no, no. God planted. Planted the garden. Look, look, in his planting, I want you to pay attention to what's there. He says that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Uh, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow. Now notice this. Every tree, it grows, and it is pleasant to the sight, and it is what? Good for food. Did you see that? Every tree. Not one or two. Every tree that God planted was uh, not only that it grew, but it was pleasant to the sight and good for food. Then he planted the tree of life. It was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he planted a tree of life and he planted a tree of death. He tells man of every tree you can eat freely except the tree of death, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that one. One rule. One rule. You know, my kids probably wished I only had one rule in our house. But we don't. We have lots of rules that we have to follow. So what happens then? Then we jump to chapter 3 of Genesis. Chapter 3 of Genesis. Look what it says down in uh, verse 6. You know the story. 
The serpent comes and he challenges Eve. He speaks to Eve. He tells her that, uh, you know, you'll not die if you eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. You'll be like God. Your eyes will be open. You'll know good and evil. Now, was he lying to her? No, he wasn't lying to her. He was telling some of the truth. But now remember, some of the truth still boils down to a lie. He's a very wise and cunning serpent. Many of us picture him as a little red man running around with a tail and a pitchfork, looking weird and ugly. No, no, no. When you look at Ezekiel chapter 28, and it talks about Lucifer and his creation, he was created perfect in wisdom and beauty. He was created perfect in power. And when he exalted himself above God, the sin that he created, that God cast him out of heaven, restricted his access to the, his throne, he didn't take any of that away. He restricts what the, end, what the enemy can do. It's all happening within God's permissible will, but he didn't take it away from him from the time that he created him. What was Lucifer's create? He was created as a cherub. And what did we talk about a couple weeks ago about the cherub? The cherubim were designed to guard things. Lucifer was at the heart of the throne of God to lead the angelic chorus to lead them in worship of the Lord. He was there to guard the throne of God, and yet he betrayed that which he was created for, for selfish desires. So he comes across the woman. He's very cunning, and he tells her some of the truth. Surely you won't die. Well, yeah, she is going to die if she eats of that tree. <laughs> but he's not gonna, she's not going to die right then. So he kind of manipulates the words. Satan will do that. Even in our day and time, we see the enemy using Hearts of truth to get people worried and in fear and upset and concerned and over anxiety and all these other emotions that we go through because we don't know the whole truth. We don't know the real truth. We have so much fake this. We have so much lies from this. We have a, a, a total lie with a little bit of truth sprinkled on there hoping we bite into the uh, lie by accepting a little bit of the truth. Folks, if it has any mixture of lie, it is a lie regardless. Look at the verse 6. Chapter 3 of Genesis says, So when the woman saw the tree was one good for food, oh, like every other tree, <laughs> that it was pleasant to the eyes, well, just like every other tree, <laughs> and the tree was desirable to make one wise. The unique purpose of the tree. But it's the tree of death. Huh. So first she got there and saw it. Then she took of the, the fruit, and then she ate of the fruit. Not only that, notice what it says next. She also gave to her husband, who was what? There with her. God gave Adam the rules of the garden. God told Adam not to eat of the tree. It was Adam's responsibility as the protector of the woman, as the lover of the woman, as the uh, spiritual leader of the house to tell the rules accurately and to follow after those rules to set a precedent to be obedient. And yet Adam was there with her, watching her look at the tree, watch her touch the fruit, watch her eat of the fruit. He didn't know what death was, but he didn't see anything happen to her. Therefore, she gave to him, and he grabbed a hold of it, ate it. Wow. Disobedience. I want you to know that every... Opportunity we have to be obedient or disobedient. It's a double-edged action. Double-edged. <laughs> one is obedience to one thing and disobedience to another. Here we have the suggestion of the enemy to disobey God. Their willful decision to eat of the fruit. Adam's willful decision to eat of the fruit. He become disobedient to God, but he came obedient to Satan's suggestion. Now, you know, there's a famous saying that goes out there. A lot of times kids learn it when they're younger and get into it when they're teenagers. Oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, the devil made me. Yeah, the devil can't make us do anything. All he can do is offer suggestions for us to go after. He entices us with the pride of life. He, he tries to lure us in with the lust of the eye. He tries to lure us in with the lust of the flesh. You know, it looks good. It feels good. It tastes good. Let's do it. Let's go after it. Let's get that gratification, gratification now. <laughs> no. Obedience. To God is disobedience to Satan's suggestion. But here we see an obedience to the suggestion by Satan in disobedience to God. 
Well, instead of being having godlike power, the knowledge brought to them a sense of first it was um, inadequacy, next it was terror or fear, and then it was shame. Adam sinned willfully with his eyes wide open, and the world was changed forever. Ownership has been taken from God and given to man, and man has surrendered it up to the enemy. He forfeited to the enemy. The world has been changed ever since. Obeying the suggestion of the enemy and disobedience to God lost ownership of the land that God had given, the world that God had given to man. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Man was created to fit the earth. Our body breathes in what we call oxygen. There's more to it than just oxygen. Uh, we exhale. We are created for this planet. This planet was created for us. It is a cycle of life, a circle. We got plants that give off the oxygen that we need, and we give off the, what the uh, plants need. We are designed for this earth. Wow. What a beautiful picture that is when you see what, how God created us. Now, there's some people out there that say that we just came from an accident of millions and millions of years of something happening in the mud, and all of a sudden we, we, we get this form that comes out, and then we evolve into another. And, and you know what's amazing? Science has proven that our first cell at conception, the first cell, the very first cell in everybody's body, has over 500, if we were to write it down, Every uh, programming that it has, if we were to write it down, it would take up over 500 pages. It tells us how tall we're going to be, how long our arms are going to be, about having two arms, two lungs. It talks about it is everything that our body has in that first cell. If we interrupt the growth of that cell at any stage, it interrupts our growing process. One cell with all of that created for us. Now, folks, it's hard for me to believe that there's people ignorant enough to think that we were an accident, that the earth just happened to be just exactly what we needed as man, and that we evolved. It takes more faith for that garbage than I, I have. It's easier to believe in a creator who loved us, who created this planet, who created us in it, perfectly matched for it. Wow, what a beautiful picture. Now, let's go to Matthew. We need to go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. There's a reason we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus came to this earth, born as a baby, grew up, walked in our footsteps, understood what it's like to go through things we go through. And then we get to a spiritual high in chapter 3 where Jesus is baptized by John. And at the baptism, we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll back up. I'll, I'll read to you in chapter 3. If you got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 3, look down with me in verse 16. It says, When Jesus had been baptized, he came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a loud voice came from heaven saying, This is is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all there. Those who witnessed that heard a loud thundering. Then we get to chapter 4. Many times after a spiritual high, we'll encounter a challenge from the enemy. And that's exactly what happens here. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led up by who? He wasn't led up. He wasn't driven out by the enemy. He was driven. He was led by the Spirit. It says, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, we know that wilderness is a place for a growth. We know that it can be a place for spiritual growth. We know that uh, we saw Paul. He went to the wilderness. We, we've seen many of the, the leaders of over time have gone into what they call a wilderness, a place of, of reflection and study and understanding of what truth is. And here, he was led. Jesus was led into the wilderness. Now, it's amazing that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. They failed many tests given to them by God. Jesus could be representing Israel when he was driven out into the wilderness by the Spirit. He could represent taking the failure and turning it into faith. Let's see what happens here. It says that he was taken um, to the wilderness and he was there tempted by the devil. 
What is the temptation that the enemy has for Jesus, the Son of God who created the whole entire world and everything in it? What possible temptation could the enemy give to the Son of God? Well, you've got to remember, while he's fully God, he's also fully human. What does a lot of temptations that are before us? It's a shortcut to immediate goals. We want it now. We want it instant. We want, we'll, we'll cheat the system. We, we, it's a shortcut. It's not putting forth the hard work. Folks, do you realize we live with a generation of, of people that think they are entitled to everything that their fathers and grandfathers had and not realizing that their grandfathers worked for 40, 50 years to get what they had? Um, then you got the, the, the parents who worked for 40, 50 years to get what they have, and you got a generation that thinks they're better than anybody else in the previous generation, and they should get it now, immediate. See, they would sacrifice everything to get what their parents had to work hard for. What is the, uh, the temptation of the enemy? It's a shortcut to immediate goals or employing the wrong means to achieve the results quicker. Wow. Look what it says now. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted, how long? Forty days and forty nights. Now that could be in the midst of that. Matthew puts the temptation at the end of that forty-day fast. We have other gospel writers that put it in, in the temptation within that. Regardless of what it is, I'm hungry after two days. I mean, I'm pretty much hungry after eight hours. I'm not eating. I, I like to eat. I enjoy eating. I'm glad that I have taste buds and I can taste the wonderful food. Sometimes Paul makes some incredible, great meals like yesterday because it takes a lot of hard work to put together a meal. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of preparation. And, and if you enjoy cooking, it's fun. It's exciting. It's a celebration, especially when that end means tastes really good. And then we have a tendency to calculate how much the whole entire meal costs. Have lots of leftovers and, you know, feed a family four, five, or six, and it only costs eight or nine dollars. Wow! Look at the money we save by not going out. But now I also like to go out because, you know, sometimes the restaurant's cooking a lot different than I can ever cook it. It's just so different. You know, I don't have to work. I just go show up. I can get money. You know, easy come, easy go. But food, I love food. Jesus was hungry. That's talking about his human side, fully God, but yet fully human. Now, when the tempter came to him, the tempter said, if... You are the Son of God. Now, I want you to understand something, folks. It's not that the devil is challenging him as if he is not the Son of God. What he's trying to do is set the stage and saying, well, if you are the Son of God, you should have confidence in the Father. You should accept the things the Father has for you. You should be able to ask of the Father certain things. You know, when our children are comfortable with us as parents, they trust us. They have confidence with us. Sometimes they'll ask for things that they know we're not going to give them, but they'll ask for them. You know, I want you to understand something, that sonship, being the son, doesn't mean that we can make demands upon the father. It doesn't give us the right to make demands. What does the father want to see from us? All fathers, all parents, they want to see obedience. Now, we know in the teenage years, teenagers, they want to rebel. They want to buck the system. They want to try to stand on their own two feet, and they want to challenge everything the parents put out. Um, Jesus knows that son, being a son of God doesn't mean that he can make demands upon the Father. He has come to this earth willingly to be obedient to the Father. Now, is the suggestion, look at the suggestion. It says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, I want you to understand something. When I was in Israel, no matter where you go, you get these rocks. They're, they're not like we have in Pennsylvania, which, of course, I come from the south where we only have sand. So these rocks in Pennsylvania are very unique and very different and, and, and crazy looking. But, but a lot of the stones out in um, uh, near Bethlehem in that area, they're, they look like bread. They look like a loaf of bread, you know. We didn't, you, you, you couldn't go to the store and get sliced bread, you know. You had to go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. Now, it, they look like loaves of bread. And if you're hungry, you start seeing things that might not really be. So what is Satan saying? He's saying, hey, if you're the son of God, command that these stones turn to bread so you can satisfy your hunger. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, it's making a demand upon the Father. Now, I want you to understand something. Israel, when they were in the wilderness wandering, they whined about it. They didn't have no bread. They had nothing to eat. They cried to God, oh, we're going to die. You know, you brought us out here, Moses, to let us die. What's wrong with you? They have no food. They didn't have faith. So what did Moses do? He asked God. And what did God do? He provided every morning manna. Enough for them to feed their whole household. What was that man? What was that? Uh, it, it, it was sufficient. It was satisfying. Uh, and it was. I got it written down here somewhere. 
Sufficient, satisfying, and sustaining. They ate that bread every morning. God said, don't take too much. Just what you need for your family. If they, matter of fact, some of them didn't listen. They took too much. It, it, come little worms inside there, you know. It, it wasn't the manna that they collected in the morning. What was the manna look like? It looked like dew upon the ground. They go out there and get what they needed. It was satisfying, filled that hunger spot. It was sustaining, gave them energy that they need throughout the day. And it was sufficient for what they needed. Jesus tells us later on in Matthew that he is the bread of life. He came down from the glory to bring the bread so that we could eat. He is all satisfying. He is all sufficient. He is all sustaining. Jesus knew that he was tempted to turn the stone into bread. Supernatural provision instead of waiting on the Father to provide in obedience. Look what happens in verse 4. Jesus answered and said, it is written. Some of my favorite words, you know. We always wonder, what did Jesus do when he became 12 years old? Because there's not much mention of him from 12 years old until we see him come onto the scene to minister at 30, you know. What did he do for all them years? He was studying the word of God. He was in the, he, he was fully God, but he was fully man. He had studied the word that he is the one who wrote through devout men. We need to spend time like that, studying. Why? Because we can't tell the enemy when the temptation comes, hey, wait, 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 wait. The Bible says something about this. Let me look it up. We need to hide his word in our hearts so we're not sinned against God. So when the temper comes, we have the words and we can speak to him. And when we quote the words of God, he will flee from us. So here, Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Spiritual food is needed just as much as physical food. I can't go too long without eating. I can't go too long without studying his word. I can't go too long without uh, drinking my coffee. I can't go too long without talking to him. It, it, it's a given to I have to do it. I need to. When we don't do it, our heart becomes a little bit harder toward the things of God. Sinful temptations become a little bit easier to give in to. And once we give in to it, it breaks our fellowship with God. It changes our relationship with the Lord at that particular time until we own it, ask forgiveness, and move forward, repent from it. We have that broken fellowship. Look what happens then. That was the first temptation. It was a physical need that would have only satisfied temporarily. You know how it is. You eat bread. What happens a little bit later? You get hungry again. <laughs> you know, then we get to the second temptation. Look what happens in verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city. That's Bethlehem. Set him on the pinnacle of the temple, the topest part, the highest part of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written... He shall give his angels. God shall give his angels charge over you and in their hand, uh, hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now what's going on here? He's quoting scripture. The enemy of God quoting scripture. It's an act of presumption for Satan to be proposing that such a leap is a leap of trusting in God. Jesus saw it as a temptation, tempting God. Scripture can be used or abused. Here we see a perfect illustration of it being abused as it's being used in isolated text out of context as a, pimp, a proof text. Folks, we cannot do that. Taking one text, that's why I have issues with topical preaching where we take one verse here and one verse there. And one, you can make pigs fly if you do that. That's not what God's called us to do. All throughout his scripture, he's always called us to study his word in a pattern, in a system. He wants us to understand the truth by the context therein. Not one verse taken out of context. And boy, the lost people, they love to grab onto a verse and, and, and say, you, you, you people are weird. Look, y'all believe this? You know, it'll take something out of context. And when you take it into context, yeah, it is what we believe. Out of context, maybe not. we got to look at it in context. When people bring scripture to me, emailing it, or call me up and they want to know about this one verse, I'm like, wait. If you're the ones the ones who done that, you know what I do. Wait. Back up. we got to look at the whole chapter. Not only the chapter, we need to know what's going on socially, what's going on religiously, what's going on economically. We need to know the background of what's going on to take place. Here, the enemy knows God's word and he will use and abuse God's word to try to deceive us with a little bit of truth that brings out lack of trusting God, lack of studying and understanding his word, lack of applying his word to our life. What Satan was wanting was for people to follow Jesus by him doing a spectacular event rather than following out his righteous living and his message. So you want a spectacular event, a miracle. Let people watch you fall from here and get picked up by your angels that the Father says he'll give charge over you so that you don't hurt yourself. 
Second temptation was to fulfill uh, a false faith in God. The Israelites wandered for 40 years because they had lack of trust in God. God told them to go into the promised land of possession. They said, oh, we send spies in there. Twelve spies go in there, two come back saying, oh, let's go. God's giving it to us. Let's go. It is true that land flowing with milk and honey. Let's go. Let's be the ones that God used to bring judgment upon those wicked people that are in that promised land. It was designed for us. But those ten, those all those, we are little tiny grasshoppers and they're great big giants. They'll just squish us. We can't do it. We can't. We're not capable. They did not have trust in God. And what did they do? They went with the majority. <laughs> they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years as punishment until that generation died off because they didn't have enough faith. They didn't trust God. Jesus demonstrated faith that you have to live by every word that proceeds from the word of God. Demonstrated faith that you not uh, challenge God. Look what it says. True faith in God reflects trust in his, um, in his uh, provisions. Look what happens in, in, in the next part of verse, what is that? Uh, seven. It says, Jesus said, it is written, quote again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then we get the third temptation. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So now he's taking Jesus. So shows us his power. See, he still had power. He took Jesus. They didn't walk for two or three days. He took him. So probably like that. Brought him to a high mountain. And he shows him all the kingdoms. Now, there is no mountain in the Bethlehem, Jerusalem area that you can see all of the kingdoms. But he's shown him. It says, all of the kingdoms and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things, all the kingdoms and all of their glory, I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Commit adultery. Satan was offering a crown without the cross. Jesus' mission was to come down to this earth and redeem not just man, but to redeem the earth. Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians. Paul calls him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians. Jesus called him the ruler or the prince of the world in John 14. Look at Jesus' response in verse 10. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He doesn't challenge Satan's ownership of the world. Did you see that? Satan is, is boasting. I own all the kingdoms and his glory. I will give it to you. He said, see, I have it. It's mine. I have ownership of it. It was surrendered to me by man. I own it, but I will give it to you if you bow down and worship me. A cheap way. Forget the cross, the agony, and the suffering. Forget obedience to the Father. I will give it to you. Jesus doesn't rebuke him for that. He says, you shall not worship anything else, anyone else except so that's why I believe that as we go back to, um, of course, Israel, when they were in the wilderness, what they do? <laughs> Mount, uh, Moses uh, goes up on a mountain. When he comes down, they worship an idol. They failed the test three times, three different specific areas. Jesus fulfilled those areas. Now, understand, these weren't the only temptations that Jesus had. The Bible tells us very clearly he was tempted in all ways and yet was without sin. Always, which means all manner of temptation. He was tempted and yet he remained without sin. Now let's go back to our, our scripture. We're in Re uh, Revelation chapter 5. That's why I believe that scroll is the title deed to the earth. Look what it says. And I saw in chapter one, uh, 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside in the back. Sealed with what? Seven seals. One seal would be effective. Seven would make it impossible for it to be opened or breached without people knowing it because it would have been evident. So look what it says. Then I saw a strong messenger, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. He's asking a question. The question's not just for the one on the throne. It's not just for John who's representing the church. It's a question for all of creation of all the universe, of all the galaxy. 
So you've got to picture this mighty warrior of an angel asking in a very loud voice. Look what he says. Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth was able to open the scroll and look on it. Wow. What a spectacular sight for John to behold as he sees the scroll, as he sees the seven seals, as he sees the angel proclaiming and he hears the loud voice with the question, who is worthy? The challenge has been laid out. And yet, we don't know how much time stood still. We don't, you know, in heavenlies, there, there, there is no time. We don't know how much time was reflected in waiting for the answer. I believe that John, who represents the church, understood what that scroll was. I believe he understood it to be ownership of the earth, title to the earth. I believe he understood that. And when no one was worthy, he was heartbroken. Look what he says in verse 4. So I did what? I wept much. He was broken. Now i got to tell you something about property rights in, in the Jewish culture. Whoever was the rightful owner of a piece of property, if he hit hard times and he needed to sell that property in order to sustain life for his family, he could sell that. But every sale had a provisional statement in it. That provisional statement said that, you know, that he's passing ownership of this property to this person for a set amount of time. But if the original owner acquires the funding that he needs, whatever that clause says, within that time given, then he can go back and redeem his property. He can give the money, uh, whatever is stipulated in that agreement, to the owner to receive it back to the rightful owner. And if it got close to the end of that time and he didn't have the resources to get the land back, then he could turn to his brother, someone close to him, a kinsman that could come alongside that had it that said, I will redeem that property for you. And so that little clause in there. So, you know, you didn't get ownership. Now, if something happened and the original owner didn't have the ability to redeem it, his relatives didn't have the ability to redeem it, then after the set time, the ownership was passed from the original owner onto the one who stood up and, and, and bought it. So in that thought, there's a story that goes back. Many of you know it. It's a, God always has the ability to uplift women, to exalt them, to lift them up in, in a culture that always puts women down. And here, yeah, you, you got God. We got a whole book. It's titled Ruth. Ruth is an amazing story. Ruth is about a, a she, uh, Naomi is married to a man. They leave Bethlehem. They sell the property. They go to uh, Moab. And while they're there, their two sons take Moabite women as, as wives. And in the process of, of, of time, not very long time, both without children, both of her son-in-laws die. I mean, uh, both of her sons die. And her daughter-in-laws have no children. Her husband has died. And so she, Naomi, goes to those two women and in brokenness tells them, go back to your father's house, find another, for I'm old and cannot have any more children. And who could wait for me to raise another boy for you to marry, to, to, to have a son on his behalf of my sons that have died? So the first one says, okay, kisses her and leaves. The second one, Ruth, says, uh, I want to stay with you. I want your God to be my God. I want your people to be my people. Please don't ask me to leave. I want to go with you. So Ruth goes with Naomi. They go back, gleaning in some fields. They have another uh, one of these laws that said that farmers that were gleaning their crops, they were collecting their crops, they could only swipe through a crop one time. Whatever they didn't get, they had to leave for the poor. It was called a, a clause for the pover, pover, those in poverty to come and eat. So uh, Ruth is going out to do this. And Boaz takes notice of her. And he says, woo that's the Moabite woman to come back with uh, Naomi. And he tells his gleaners, he says, hey, you know what? If it's a hard time, you just drop some of that grain down there for her. You, you, do, you know, you miss some of that on purpose. You, you make sure she has what she has. And she goes to her. He goes to her and says, hey, don't go glean in any other's field. You come only to my field. And he tells all of his workers, don't you touch her. Don't, don't touch her. 
You leave stuff in her. You bless her. Matter of fact, if she wants to come and dip her bread in your soup, you let her. She, she wants you to draw water from the well so she can drink. You do it for her. See, God had put Boaz to take care of Ruth, and Ruth didn't even know it. But yet Ruth was faithful to God, faithful to Naomi. Brings this food back to Naomi, and Naomi said, what? What, where'd you go to get that? And she says, oh, I was gleaning in Boaz's field. He said, you don't go anywhere else. You go back to Boaz. You just stay focused there. <laughs> then what happens a little bit later? She tells but Ruth, you go and you watch them. And when they lay down to sleep, you pay attention to where Boaz goes. Then you go and you get his blanket from his feet and you cover yourself with that. This was a sign saying, I am a property that you can redeem because you are a kinsman redeemer. You are a relative of my husband. And if you will have me, I would allow you to redeem my husband by giving me a child in honor of him. Boaz wakes up and says, what are you doing here? And he goes, and she tells him the story. He goes, hey, you get out of here before everybody sees it. We don't even want anybody to think uh, anything's going on here. And so he says, there's one closer to you. One that's a little bit closer in relation. We've got to go to him first. So Boaz says, you don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. She goes back to Naomi and Naomi says, what you, what you, what you doing back here so saying? And he goes, well, he caught me and he taught me. And he says, there's one that's a little bit closer. He says, he's going to take care of it. Naomi, hey. If he said he's going to take care of it, don't worry about it. He's going to take care of it. So, come to find out, Boaz goes to the next kin, kinsman redeemer and says, Hey, there's this beautiful piece of property. Naomi's father, I mean, Naomi's husband had. They sold it. Um, we are at the time that we can redeem that property. You have the rights. And he goes, Oh, yeah, that's a good piece of property. Yeah, I think I might do that. And he goes, Wait, though. It has a clause. You have to take his wife, Ruth. Oh, no, no, my, my wife ain't going for that. <laughs> That's not going to work. I can't do that. Uh, here's my shoe. So normally if you had something to redeem you and you didn't want to redeem you, you give it a shoe and, you know, like stinky feet. I mean, like, like uh, you, you, you're the bad soul, whatever it is. So he's like, I can't, I can't redeem it. You spit in the face, actually, and I would not like that. I would not even approach him. But he didn't have to spit in, in Boaz's face. Boaz took the shoe, went to the council, and said he does not want to redeem our kinsman relative's property. I do. And he redeemed that property, not because he needed another piece of property, folks. He had property. It's because he wanted Ruth to be his bride. He saw her as a treasure. He saw her love for Naomi. He saw her love for Naomi's God. He saw her love in the sacrifices she made. He falls in love with her. He wants her to be his bride. He redeemed the property in order to have the bride. Sound familiar? Well, look, if you think about this, Boaz and Naomi, I mean, Boaz and Ruth, they have a son who has a son named Jesse, who has a son named David. You see that? A great grandson is David, who becomes the greatest king to have ever lived in Israel, uniting the southern and the northern kingdoms together. He is not only a king of kings, he is a, a high priest. He leads people in worship of God as well as lead the people. Look what it says right here as we get close to finishing up. John wept because no one was found worthy to open, to read the scroll, or to even what? Look at it. Nobody can even look at it. I don't know about you. It just breaks my heart as John is weeping because no one is found worthy. Folks, understand that the best we can ever do is not worthy before God. It's only what he does through us that brings worthiness to us. It's because he looks at us and says we are worthy. Look what it says. It says that no one was found worthy to open or to read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, king of all beasts, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. That's lineage, king of king of Israel. Uh, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open a scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, or coming out of the throne, and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood, what? A lamb, as though it had been slain. Now, I want you to think about something for a moment. 
This lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns. Horns represent power and authority. And seven eyes, all seeing, which are the seven spirits of God, sent into all of the earth. We talk about the completeness of the seven spirits of God. It's only one spirit. It's just the different characteristic attributes that it had. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Look what it says. Now, the elder sees a lion. John looks and sees a lamb. Not just a lamb, pretty and fluffy and go pet the lamb. He sees a lamb that had been slain. Now, folks, if this is our, as John represents the church, if this is our, for, I want you just to be aware that while we may see Christ on the throne dressed as a high priest, in the midst of that throne or coming out of that throne in the middle of the area right there at that particular moment, maybe the believers are going to see the lamb. Slain. What does it look like? What did Jesus look like? Well, he was not recognizable in his glorified body. Remember Mary? She saw him, thought he was a gardener. Some people say it was because she had tears in her eyes and prism. She couldn't really see clear. But then we got disciples who walked with him all the way on the road of Timaeus. They invited Jesus to stay. He was acting like he was going to go on, and they invited him to stay. He stayed. They didn't know who he was until he broke bread with them and he prayed. And when he prayed, they recognized him, and he was gone. What is it going to look like when we get to the glory of heaven? What is Jesus going to look like? We may be like the elder and see him as a lion. <laughs> because see, lion is going to be bringing victory for us. A lion of the tribe of Judah, king of all. Jesus is king of all. Maybe it's the lost that will see him as a slain lamb. Or maybe when we first get there, you know, Thomas, doubting Thomas, he said, oh, unless I thrust my hand in his side, unless I put my hands in his nail print hands, I won't believe. Maybe God wants us to see him. As the sacrifice for our wrong. What will you do if you see him? Isaiah chapter 53 talks about him in the most graphic detail of what he was going to look like on that cross. And it talks about him being unrecognizable as a man. Skin pulled off of his body, open flesh setting there, a face that we could not tell who it is, broken and battered. Remember when it said they punched him, they blindfolded him and punched him? We know that, you know, you can prepare yourself for a hit if you know it's coming. But if you're blindfolded, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where to, how to protect yourself. You don't know how to go with the punch. You know, talk about go with the flow, go with the punch. You know, uh, football players, when they get a tackle, they go with the tackle. Who, when does the quarterback usually get hurt the worst is when he gets blindsided. He don't see it coming because he's not prepared for it. His body's not strengthened and tensed up for it. Jesus was hit repetitively over and over. He was bruised for our iniquity. Our chastisement was upon him. And yet he did it with his love for you and me to endure punishment that most people would have died under. What's Jesus going to look like when we get to glory? What's he going to look like? Will for a moment we see him as the sacrifice for us? Will we see all of the wounds that he took on for us? I want you to be, just be aware in case we get there. He's not this beautiful picture you have pictured, you know, with beautiful flowing hair and beautiful eyes and beautiful skin tone. And just in case, just in case. Now, we know that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and we will see him as the lion. We will see him in all victory. We will submit to him and follow after him. We know, and I think at the judgment throne of Christ, I think that at the white throne judgment, when all of the lost are there, I think they will see him. As the lamb sacrificed for them that they rejected. And that they will, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And I think when we see that glory of God that we'll see in just a few chapters, that will be when he transforms from that lamb into that lion. And he will cast judgment upon those who rejected him. What will you do with him today? See, today you have the opportunity. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you're listening and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, I want to tell you that he loves you so much he went to a, a, a bat for you. He went and paid the full price for you. Why? Because he wanted to redeem you. Who are you? The bride of Christ. The church is his bride. 
He didn't come back to redeem this earth just to redeem the earth because he needed more worlds to, to have. He came back because of the bride. He wanted to redeem the earth for the bride. What will you do with him? You may be here and say, oh, Brother Kenny, I invite Jesus in my heart, but you know I've been living my own life. I've been going after my own things. I have been so caught up in my own world, I haven't even paid attention to what he's done for me. Folks, all you have to do is ask him to forgive you for that and, and, and recommit your life to him saying, I want to live for you today, Jesus. I want to live for you every single day for what you did for me, what you gave up for me, the blessings you poured out upon me because of the curse you took on my behalf. He's waiting to hear from you. It's up to you. It's your choice. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God down on the cross and rose again. Then confess him with your mouth. What you believe in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved, but it's up to you. It's your choice. He gave you the ability to think, reason, and choose. He wants you to choose him. He won't force himself upon you. He will bless you when you choose him. Uh, know that he loves you, and he, he wants you to focus on him if you've already been a believer. If you've not been baptized, we can take care of that. We can baptize you. Uh, baptism doesn't save you. It's just an outward expression of an inward change. We'll get there before long. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. Right now, look into your heart. Look into your soul. Where do you stand for, before God? Father, we just thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray a blessing upon those that are listening. We pray if anyone's here, anyone listening, anyone's focused on the, your, your message today, that they'll understand that you came to this earth to pay the price so you can redeem this earth for the bride, for them who are created in your image and likeness, beautiful and wonderfully made just the way they are. You accept them just the way they are. Father, we just pray a blessing upon them. Thank you for what you're going to do to change the Baptist Church around our community and around this world. Help us to continue to be faithful and follow after you. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, folks, I wanted to give you an update. We've had a, a meeting with our leadership, and uh, we, we've gone to yellow. Praise the Lord. Um, but we're hoping that if there's no virus for the next 14 days, we should be going green if we follow suit with that with no coronavirus uh, and we able to get to green on uh, June the, the 12th, which is 14 days after we've been on yellow. That's the earliest possible time we can go green. When we go green, that doesn't mean it's back to normal. It's back to usual. Green still has some restrictions and limits. What does it mean? It means that we will open the doors on June the 14th for you to come in to worship the Lord, although doors have always been open for 25 or less. But what we have to do is we have to do social distancing. So what we will do is we'll have people come in. We will set you in places. We will have marked off places you can't set. We will have cluster groups of families, families that have been hanging out together, that live together. You can stay together, and then we'll have them designate all throughout. We can put 40 family groups in our sanctuary. We'll have the gym set up where we put 20 or 30. Or if you're a visitor and you've never been here, we'll be able to have a place. If you're here early, you get to get in the sanctuary. If you're here later, you get to go over to the gym. But nevertheless, you can be here seeing the worship with the music and hear Jackie Lee. We will have all that taking place. We are hoping we're able to do that. Uh, no handshaking, no hugging, none of this stuff. Bring your own sanitation to sanitizer. If you want sanitizer, why? If you want to deliver, bring it yourself, please. If you want to wear a mask, bring the mask. Wear the mask. It's not for your safety. It's for everybody else's safety. Bring what you think will make you feel safe. We're going to do everything we can. When we exit, we got a door over here to exit. We got a door over here. We got a door back there. We got a door over here for the gym. They have a door in the back. We got exits easy. That's easy to cover. We're not going to collect an offering. We're going to put an offering box out there. You just put your offering in there. It's your tithes. It's your commitment to God. It's your uh, opportunity to be a blessing. We'll have somebody staged out there. We'll have uh, a couple family units can be out there. We got one person going to be guarding our money. Make sure nobody comes in here uh, to take it. And, 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 of course, you know, they would be crazy to come in here anyway because we got more armed people per person than anything else. So they'd be wiped out. We're not going to tell them to surrender. We're going to shoot them, take them out. So praise the Lord. <laughs> Safe. But safety is first and we health is, is, is second. So make sure um, you pray about this that we'll stay on green and we'll be able to open these doors. Praise the Lord for what he's going to accomplish. Don't get upset with the world. It's something they've never seen before. They don't know. I know there's a bunch of lies out there. There's a bunch of truths out there. Which one's are Ruth lies and which one's truth? We don't know. But we're going to err on the side of caution at all times. Follow the leadership of our uh, governor, what he said. Yes, regardless if you like them or not, we're going to obey what God's told us to obey the person, people in control of us, in charge of us, because he's anointed them to be that. So praise the Lord. You pray for them.